afternoon. It's Wednesday, January 4th. I'm Laura Cornfield, and this is IBA News broadcasting live from Jerusalem. After a 10-month trial, a military court has ruled that Sergeant Elor Azaria's testimony was unreliable and convicted him of manslaughter for shooting dead a wounded Arab terrorist in Hebron. The unanimous tribunal also convicted him of behavior unbecoming of an Israeli soldier. In a two and a half hour summing up the deliberations that led to the verdict, the leading judge, Colonel Maya Heller, said Azaria's bullet killed the incapacitated terrorist. The court also rejected the soldier's testimony that he shot the terrorist in the head because he felt threatened and said he opened fire in violation of orders. The terrorist did not pose any threat and there was no operational justification for shooting. They said Azaria's statement after the shooting that the terrorist deserved to die had significant weight in their decision. The incident took place March 24th when two terrorists stabbed and wounded two soldiers in Hebron and both were neutralized. Video footage showed Azaria at the scene 10 minutes later opening fire. The court is expected to sentence the 19-year-old soldier next month. The high-profile trial was deeply divisive for the country. Azaria's lawyers accused the court of bias and said they will appeal the decision. Amid a heightened police presence, hundreds of protesters gathered outside the courtroom to declare their solidarity for El Azaria. During the morning, clashes erupted between protesters and police, and four demonstrators were arrested. A number of protesters chanted a warning to Chief of Staff Gadi Eisenkot, saying, Gadi, be careful. Rabin is looking for a friend, referring to the slain former prime minister. Some of the protesters were masked. Others held banners reading, People of Israel, do not abandon a soldier in the battlefield. Knesset members, members of the right-wing La Lava La group, Beitar Jerusalem soccer fans were also among the crowd, which included members of the criminal La Familia group affiliated with the soccer team. Former Prime Minister and Defense Minister Ehud Barak criticized the protesters and called on Prime Minister Netanyahu to back up the Chief of Staff. Yeshatid leader Yair Lapid called to end the violence and irresponsible statements. Responding to the court's decision, Defense Minister Avigdor Lieberman said the court's verdict must be respected by all and urged for restraint. Lieberman called on the public to refrain from criticizing the chief of staff, saying the army must be kept out of all political debates. He went on to say that while he did not like the verdict, the defense establishment will assist the soldier's family. Minister of Culture Miri Regev said while she honors the court's decision, she intends to initiate steps to have Elor, Elor Azaria pardoned. Education Minister Naftali Bennett echoed similar sentiments, as well as Zionist Union M.K. Shelley Yichimovich. No soldier or parents of soldiers should have to be caught between politics and the army, M.K. Tsipi Livni said. While one can understand the difficult situation Azaria's parents face, one cannot legitimize Azaria's actions. M.K. Amir Peretz called on his fellow lawmakers to accept the verdict, saying the army was and remains the most moral army in the world. Iman Oda, head of the Joint Arab List, said Azaria's actions are the result of Israel's occupation, adding those responsible for the occupation of Palestinian land should be held accountable. Joining us in the studio is Ari O'Sullivan, who's been following the trial. Ari, it was argued that convicting Azaria would make soldiers in the field hesitate to thwart terrorists. Has the evidence proved that correct? That was the argument, Laura. The people said that uh, soldiers will now, if there's a, a terrorist attack, they will hesitate. Now, if you look at the incidents for the past nine months, there have been hundreds of incidents with scores of Arab terrorists who have been killed by police and by Israeli soldiers. And in none of these cases, it's known that there was any hesitation. In fact, there's been sometimes a use of excessive force. So this argument really didn't turn out to be true. Ari, uh, this looked like a circus. Could it have been handled differently? Well, some people say there should not have been a trial at all. I mean, the, most Israelis think that uh, the image of an Israeli soldier going, who killed a terrorist, going to a trial is something they do not want to see. But there had to be a trial because the IDF credibility was at stake here. There had to be a court martial. And, and people would say that the army, if they didn't do that, would not know how to investigate itself. But it could have been done differently, perhaps. It could have been done behind closed doors. In fact, the, the judges asked both sides, the prosecution and the defense, to come to some kind of a plea, agree, plea bargain agreement. But the prosecution has decided, decided not to do that. That's something we're going to have to see. And, uh, and no matter what happened, it wasn't going to come out looking good. Arya, what kind of sentence could Azaria be facing? 
the judges are going to be considering a few things be, uh, about the, before they do the sentencing. They're going to look at the soldier. Azaria was not, uh, he was an honorably serving soldier in a combat unit. They're going to look at his family situation. And they're probably leaning towards a lenient between a two and eight uh, year term, probably closer to the two year term. The army does not want to see him punished very severely. But um, the problem is also there's going to be an appeal. So we'll have to see how that plays into it as well. Uh, this is a case of one soldier and one incident. Why has it generated so much political debate and aroused so much passion in the public? Well, this was a very deeply dividing trial. I mean, we had, we had members of the Knesset and generals and taking both sides. We had a former defense minister, a present defense minister taking a side. We had the chief of general staff even yesterday said something. In fact, the prime minister actually called up Azaria's father and offered him support. But it's it sort of... This is not something that's going to be particularly uh, very good for Israel. There was a, um, people who thought that Azaria was a hero and should not have been put on trial. And other people thought he was maybe just a misled, twisted soldier. And so what brought it, there was a crowd today. We saw the crowd. These people were from a, a very right wing. They're actually supporters of a, a football group that's a racist football group. They were abusing Azaria. They're abusing his, for their own image, for their own political purposes. But... It's his trial was brought the values of the Israeli army to fore, the values of self-defense, the values of purity of arms against a very vicious enemy, and a quest of victory. So we're going to have a situation where it also touched upon the fissures of Israeli society, sometimes even between secular and religious, between left and right. It's not going to be uh, over with today's verdict, and it's going to be with us for a long time, Laura. One last question, Ari. What is the challenge facing the Army now? Well, the Army now has to educate its soldiers to know when is it that this is a terrorist attack, that if you're going to be using force to thwart a terrorist attack or to prevent any sort of an attack against civilians or in an operation, when is it that that moment you can use force, and when that moment goes beyond the incident, and when is that moment? Is it... Does it come to a point where it turns into vengeance or it turns into um, criminal act? And I think most of the soldiers would look at the video of Azaria in Hebron and would say, you know, no matter what they thought about Arabs or terrorists, but when they see that the soldier arrives there, 10 minutes, 11 minutes after the incident is over, and he opens fire at a terrorist who may they think deserved to have been killed, most soldiers would say, oops. That's in violation of the rules of engagement. And I think the Army's challenge now is to try to embed that more and more into the soldiers. And I think this trial is going to help that. Ari O'Sullivan, thanks so much. A short time ago, Major Chagai Ben-Ari was laid to rest in the village of Haspin in the north. Ben-Ari, who served in the elite reconnaissance unit in the paratroopers brigade, was shot in the head by a sniper while operating in Gaza during Operation Protective Edge in 2014. Declared the most critically wounded soldier in the campaign, Ben Ari never regained consciousness. Two months after his injury, at his hospital bedside, his commanding officer promoted Chagai to commander of the paratroopers' reconnaissance unit, a position he was to have been appointed to at the end of the Gaza war. Ben Ari, age 31, died last night, surrounded by his family in Moshav Nov in the Golan Heights. He leaves behind a wife, three young children, parents, and siblings. Two border police officers were injured early yesterday evening after being hit by a Palestinian motorcyclist at a temporary checkpoint set up north of Janine in the West Bank. The two officers, one female, were said to be in light to moderate condition and were taken to hospital. It is unclear whether the Palestinian motorcyclist purposely rammed into them. Police are still investigating the motives. According to initial findings, border police deployed at a temporary checkpoint flagged down the motorcyclists as they approached the roadblock. The four attempted to swerve and bypass it. Three succeeded, and the fourth, ridden by two Palestinians, hit the border police officers. The two Palestinians who were lightly injured were also taken to hospital. Israel is focusing all efforts in trying to prevent further action against the Jewish state in the United Nations, Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu said at a meeting with Israeli ambassadors yesterday. Israel has received indications that some of the countries slated to attend the upcoming peace summit in Paris may try to turn some of the decisions made at the summit into additional UN Security Council resolutions against Israel. That is why Israel's primary efforts are now focused on preventing additional resolutions, as well as trying to prevent decisions that may be made by the quartet, Netanyahu said, 
referring to the U.S., Russia, the U.N., and European Union. Israel has rejected the upcoming Paris summit, calling the effort futile, adding the only way to achieve peace and resolve issues is to hold direct negotiations between Israel and the Palestinians. School books used in United Nations-run schools in the West Bank and Gaza do not recognize the existence of the State of Israel, fail to mention the religious or historical conne connection of Jews to the Jewish state, and make no mention of holy Jewish sites, such as the Western Wall and the Cave of the Patriarchs. These are the findings of a research study on Palestinian textbooks used in the UN-run schools, conducted by Dr. Roni Shaked and Dr. Arnold Gross of the Harry Truman Research Institute at the Hebrew University. According to the findings, textbooks used in the UN schools negate the existence of Hebrew and contain no reference to the presence of Jews in Israel and Jewish cities and towns established after 1948 are erased from the maps given to children. On the first day of Congress, three Republican U.S. senators introduced a legislation that would require moving the U.S. Embassy from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem. Senators Ted Cruz, Marco Rubio, and Dean Heller proposed the Jerusalem Embassy and Recognition Act yesterday, the first day the new Republican-dominated Congress convened on Capitol Hill. While President-elect Donald Trump has repeatedly signaled his plans to move the U.S. Embassy to Jerusalem, Previous administrations have repeatedly de delayed implementation. Recently, Palestinian President Mahmoud Abbas warned that such a move will end all possibilities of achieving a two-state solution with Israel. As the Knesset debates a bill to annex to Israel Ma'ale Adumim, the largest Jewish city in Judea and Samaria, the mayor has revealed plans to double the size of the city. He was also given a boost by Governor Mike Huckabee, a former Republican candidate for U.S. President, and a close advisor to President-elect Donald Trump. IBA's Ariel Sullivan was in Malay Adumim and filed this report. It'll be called Mivaseret Adumim. A neighborhood of some 3,000 planned apartments is supposed to cover the slopes of this hill, northeast of Malay Adumim, one of the largest Jewish cities in Judea and Samaria. It's been on the drawing board since the mid-1990s, but each time it moves forward, politics have stepped in and frozen it. The latest move by Habayta Yehudi to annex Malay Adumim is welcomed by the city. My vision is that uh, the city of Malay Adumim will be a legal part of Israel with uh, 80,000 residents, with hotels, uh, central parks, commercial centers, and a large uh, industrial park. Benny Kashriel has been the mayor of Malay Adumim for the past 25 years. He's optimistic that this time the approval will finally manifest itself on the ground. Are you an obstacle to peace? <laughs> uh, to build my land on him is not to, it's not against peace, uh, peace process. Uh, the peace process can be advanced, they can talk about peace process, they can negotiate about uh, for peace process uh, while we can build. Critics of the plan say it blocks the territorial contiguity between Palestinian areas in any future state. But Kashriel says that this is disinformation, since the controversial E1 area is not connected to Jerusalem and therefore doesn't bifurcate Palestinian territory. 4,500 Palestinians are working in Malay Adumim. They are making their living in Malay Adumim. And they want to work in Malay Adumim. And we have a lot of projects that we can fulfill with, uh, with our neighbors like Azaria and Abu Dis. Abu Mazen has to understand that he cannot force his people all the time to be against us. The plan calls for doubling the population of the city of 40,000 and building 10,000 more housing units. There will also be a tourism center with hotels and an amusement park. Meanwhile, former Republican U.S. presidential candidate Governor Mike Huckabee planted a tree in Malay Dumim. Israel uh, has title deed to Judea and Samaria. Uh, there are certain words I refuse to use. The, there is no such thing as a West Bank. It's Judea and Samaria. There's no such thing as a settlement. They're communities, they're neighborhoods, they're cities. Huckabee is close to President-elect Donald Trump and came directly from a meeting with the Prime Minister. He predicts that the future of U.S.-Israel relations looks bright. I think they're going to get along terrifically well because they're both plain-spoken people. They're both natural leaders. Um, I think they both are people committed to the notion of freedom, individual responsibility, and um, self-determination. He also said words about U.S. Secretary of State John Kerry's comments about settlements. What John Kerry said was bull butter, absolute bull butter. 
it it was insulting to me as an American, and I think certainly uh, insulting to uh, Israelis as well. Mayor Kashriel said that a park would be dedicated in this valley called Huckabee Park. Malay Adumim Mayor Kashriel envisions 10,000 housing units built here on the controversial E1. Now, these plans have been on the books for many, many years. Perhaps this time, the annexation will go through. In E1, Malay Adumim, this is Arie O'Sullivan for IBA News. Police are investigating the death of a 35-year-old woman who jumped from a sixth-floor apartment in Akko after allegedly murdering her five-year-old son. Her ex-husband was apparently asleep in the next room and unaware of what had happened. He was taken in for questioning by police. Family told authorities that she was known to welfare workers and the writing was on the wall. Police are treating the incident as a suspected murder-suicide. Jerusalemites today woke up to a lack of public transport in the city after hundreds of Egged bus drivers began a one-day warning strike early this morning. Some of the drivers blocked the entrance to the main bus station in the city, preventing buses from outside of Jerusalem entering to pick up passengers. In roads surrounding the bus station, police were called in to intervene after drivers parked several buses blocking traffic. The drivers are demanding an additional sum to their hourly salary and warn they would take further action if the stalemate in talks with the Finance and Transport Ministries continues. Egged spokesman Ron Ratner called on the drivers to stop the strike and resume work immediately instead of harming the public. The Health Care Committee submitted its recommendations yesterday on which drugs should be included in this year's state-subsidized health care basket. The findings will be submitted to Health Minister Yaakov Litzman and later brought before the government for approval. The committee reviewed some 700 new requests for drugs, vaccines and technologies to be included in this year's 450 million shekel budgeted health basket. Those under consideration deal with cancer treatments, blood diseases, cardiology, neurology, gynecology, diabetes, as well as treatment for rare diseases. In local money matters, shares were mixed on the Tel Aviv Stock Exchange, while the shekel was mixed in foreign currency trading. Here are the numbers. Turning to the temperature, and a rise in temperatures is predicted over the next several days. Here are the highs and lows for the next 24 hours. This newscast, Ario Sullivan will be here tomorrow, same time, same channel. Until then, I'm Laura Cornfield, wishing you a good evening and shalom from Jerusalem.